Good morning once again and welcome to our online service. Thank you for joining with us um, at this online service. We are meeting back in the church again, so we would love to see more people um, booking and joining us at that service. So please, please book in before a Thursday um, if you want to come to this, the live service in person on a Sunday. Um, Adam will be speaking this morning, continuing our series, um, which is now for some good news. Today's sermon is called Fully Free, and we're really looking forward to, to continuing that series in the Book of Romans. I'd just like to start with um, a psalm for you, um, Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp. With the harp and the sound of singing with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. So you might not have a ram's horn or a harp this morning, but you do have your voice. So let's just sing together wherever you are um, this song, uh, Behold Our God, which is led by our praise band. <laughs>
now for some notices. Um, this morning, as it's the second Sunday in July, we'll be celebrating communion. If you're a Christian and you wish to celebrate communion with us, please have bread and wine available for that part of the service, which will be as a response um, after Adam has spoken. Other notices, um, the Holiday Club is already fully booked for the day that's going to be at New Craig's. There are some other places available uh, on other days and in other uh, parts of Krakodi, um, so don't worry if you haven't managed to book a place um, for, for your child. I can also just remind you about the, the prayer meeting on Wednesday, in-person uh, prayer meeting if you've not been back at church and you're just getting used to that idea of, of, of returning, please come uh, to the prayer meeting um, on, on Wednesday. Um, there's no need to, to book to join us um, on Wednesday at 7.30 here in the church, um, where we'll be looking um, at a post-lockdown church. Let us just turn to the Lord as we continue um, in our worship and prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning safe in the knowledge that you are the Lord of the universe, our Creator God, who made us in your image. You gave us the ability to have and make choices. This free will that you gave us, even though it means we so often make the wrong choices in our lives, help us, Lord, not to listen to the lies of the evil one whose only purpose is to seek to tear down and destroy whatever is good and holy to you. We are therefore so thankful, Father, of the finished work of our Saviour, Jesus, who died for our sins so that we don't have to die, because our sins are a barrier to our relationship with you. Thank you, Father, that we can simply accept this amazing grace for our lives, for there is nothing that we can do to work for it. Jesus has done it all. Lord, help us to share the good news, this gospel news of this life-transforming gift that is available to all, should they turn to trust in him with their whole lives. Lord, help us to hold nothing back from you or limit the work of the Holy Spirit in each of us. Prompt and lead us, we pray, in how you want us to serve you in this earth as we look to the com coming kingdom. Father, we pray for those who are on holiday right now. Lord, give them rest and relaxation, whether they're taking time off work or travelling. Minister to their minds and bodies and bring them back safe and refreshed. Lord, we continue to pray for the work of the SU ministry team as they prepare for this year's Summer Kids Club. Pray that there would be sufficient volunteers, that they would work well together and reach those children with the good news of Jesus. We pray too for the various ministries in New Craigs as we move to resume things in the coming weeks. Help us as a leadership team to plan and meet with people, to seek your will for this church as we serve the people of Kirkcaldy. Be with us now as we listen to your word and we continue in our worship. Minister to our hearts, we ask in the mighty name of Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's continue in our worship as we sing, O oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Messiah's 
sinning so that grace may increase. By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we, will, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let the sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that you, when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity, to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from things that you are now ashamed of? 
Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Pat, for bringing us that reading from Romans. Before Adam comes to speak to us, let us sing the next song, Speak, O Lord. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your life. There's a story of a docker in the middle of the 19th century in London. As he worked on the big ships that would eventually sail to America, he loaded the cargo onto these big ocean-going vessels. And as he did, he would often dream about loading himself onto one of them instead. He had heard in New York that you could become a new man. He'd heard that even if you were penniless like him, if you made it to America, you wouldn't be judged on your wealth or your background or your education, but you would be taken on face value and he could start a new life. And so every day he would dream about this promised land. And as he did, he started to save up some of his meager income a little at a time uh, until eventually the day came when he could afford to get a ticket to America. So after weeks and months of saving up, he finally went and bought his ticket. He had no extra money, and he gets on board the ship with his belongings and pockets full of bread, but no other food. But he didn't really care about that. He would rather go hungry uh, 
and get to the land of his dreams. Well, it was much harder than he'd first thought. So day one, day two, he ate the bread that was in his pockets. He was fine. Uh, there was a restaurant on board the ship that smelt so good, and he would often go up there and, and breathe in and look at the other passengers enjoying their meals. Uh, by day three, three, he had eaten what was left, and this time the bread had gone stale. Uh, day four, he had nothing to eat, and as he went up to the dining restaurant and just watched from outside, you know, in, people enjoying their breakfast, lunch, and dinner, hoping that maybe getting the smell of the food would somehow satisfy his hunger. Um, of course, it didn't. It just made things worse. And he would go down into the recesses of the ship below decks, and, and he would try to sleep it off. But, but of course, he couldn't sleep because of the hunger in his belly. <laughs> Uh, day five was even worse. Day six, he was in agony and he kept going up to the dining restaurant and tried to just pacify his hunger by reminding himself that there was this promised land to come. Uh, day seven, he could take it no longer. He went round the back uh, of the kitchen doors and he knocked on the door and he said to the chef, uh, listen, I don't care what I have to do. I'll clear plates, I'll wash up, I'll, I'll scrub floors. Just let me eat some of the scraps that come back from the plates of the other passengers. And the chef looked at him really surprised and he said to him, just show me your ticket. And the docker gave him his ticket and the chef then said, haven't you read the small print? It says, all meals included. You see, the Apostle Paul is really concerned that we will be like the docker in the 19th century, that we will think that the good news about Jesus is all about the promised land to come. It's all about enjoying something in the future and to forget that it's all about enjoying Jesus and what he's done for us today. And it's for that reason the, the, the first eight chapters of Romans are divided into three and not just into two. So from Romans 1 through to chapter 3 verse 20, it's all about salvation needed. And there are subdivisions in Romans 1 verse 17. Uh, Paul tells us the good news of the gospel before he tells us the bad news. Uh, Christianity is all about a righteousness that has been given which is received by faith for faith in and through Jesus Christ. That's how we come to get right with God. And then from verse 18 of chapter 1 through to chapter 3, verse 20, it tells us the bad news that all of us have sinned and we've missed the shot, the target, as far as God is concerned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God and so we all need forgiveness and we need to be set free. And so Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to chapter 5, verse 21 are glorious verses. It's all about salvation provided because they tell us that in the coming of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who, who dies on a cross for us to take the judgment for our sin, he comes as our representative before a holy God who, who dies, who's buried, who rises again to be our saviour. And he's the one who can make us right with God. And that's the, uh, now it's time for some good news. It's, it's the coming of Jesus Christ as he brings us forgiveness for all of us who believe. But then in Romans chapter 6, 7 and 8, where we're going now, the Apostle Paul begins to say to us, you, you mustn't starve in your cabin like that dock hand. You know, you need to realize that this is salvation to be enjoyed today. And next week, we're going to see the power that comes to us through the gospel. And today, we're leading up to that. So I want to look at these verses that Pat has read for us uh, from Romans 6, verses 1 to 23. Um, if you can see a Bible, you're going to need to, uh, so that we can learn from these verses together. These verses are all about freedom, uh, not just about forgiveness and, and the life to come, but it's about being set free in our lives right now. And I don't know about you, um, but in the past year, I think I've become more aware of how I need to be set free uh, from sin that still raises its ugly head in my life. Uh, so this past year, getting feelings of being impatient during lockdown uh, and realizing, well, what it's actually done, it's just revealed that I get impatient. You know, some of us have said, I've got real problems in my marriage or, or real problems with my children. And yet 
what lockdown has done, it's just revealed and brought to the surface some of the concerns in your marriage and relationships with your children. Uh, one of the things that's, that's been highlighted for me being at home is the, the constant need to be snacking all the time and drinking endless cups of coffee, and, and that certainly needs to change. Um, for others, it might be an increased reliance on alcohol. You know, it might be something that seems good, but it's gone bad. You know, it's like the internet, which is a wonderful thing, but, but something that, that just addicts you and robs you of the time that God gives you for other things elsewhere. And you're constantly surfing the net. You're constantly watching videos, constantly going to social media, which, which is a good thing, but, but going there to get affirmation and identity from other people, which is a bad thing. Or constantly addicted into gaming and quizzes or box set binging. I don't know what it is for you, but, but hasn't this been a time when God has helped us to realize that there are more sins in our hearts and lives than we first realized? But that's why it's such good news, that God wants to give us freedom. So here's the verses that we read. Uh, they talk about God giving you a new status. So look at verse 1 again. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order, just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. And God wants to set you free this morning. And the Apostle Paul says the way that that happens is that you go back to the waters of your baptism. A baptism is the first thing that someone does when they give their life to Jesus. And, and by that simple act of obedience, they declare publicly, I am going to follow Jesus Christ. It's the first thing Jesus commanded us to do. We repent, we turn from everything that we know to be wrong, and we turn to Christ. And then we're baptized in water. And the Apostle Paul says, go back to the waters of your baptism and remember. And people say, is it just a symbol? You know, does anything happen when you're baptized? Uh, well, here's how you can tell whether it's just a symbol or whether something powerful happens when you're baptized. When you decide that I should be baptized, you see the amount of trouble that you have when you make that decision. Again, I can remember a Muslim lad who became a Christian in Leicester and his father wasn't upset about him praying a prayer to Jesus. But when he said, I want to be baptized in water, that's when the sparks flew. And the same may be true for those from church backgrounds. You, you know, it's often the moment when you say, I'm going to be baptized as a follower of Jesus, that your parents might say, well, we christened you. How dare you insult us by being baptized again? Uh, which, of course, it's not. It's just that christening is water without any faith. Or they say you were confirmed, you had faith then. Well, yes, but it's faith without water. Now, I'm not undermining any of those events. They are expressions of a love for God, but neither of them are water baptism. So you can be grateful to your parents who cared enough about you to, to set you apart for God. Because of their devotion, you now have the opportunity to complete their prayer by willingly submitting to believers' baptism. Um, and believers' baptism is not a sign of disrespect for what your parents did. In fact, it can be seen as a fulfillment of their prayers. So be thankful for the heritage of concerned parents, but don't neglect your responsibility as a believer to make your personal pledge towards God in baptism. It may be even at the moment, you know, we're saying I'm too scared to be baptised. I don't want to do it publicly. And so we put it off. You know, we can be our own worst enemy. You see, Paul says that actually a spiritual battle is happening because something happens when you're baptised in water 
which then becomes massively important when we want to live out our freedom in Jesus. And Paul says, when you get down into the water and you go under the water, it's a sign, it's a symbol of your faith that you have died with Jesus. You're dead. You've been buried with Jesus. Your old life is over. And when you're brought up out of the water with the help of another, it's a sign that you've been raised to new life with Jesus. And when you walk out of the waters of your baptism, it's a sign that your new life has begun. And the Apostle Paul doesn't say, go back to the moment when you prayed a prayer. No, he says, go back to that tangible moment where the whole of you, spirit, soul and body, you were baptised as a complete person, declaring that my whole life has changed. He says, go back to that moment and remember, you're now set free. And then we might say, well, how? Well, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 2. Uh, Paul wrote this at the same time as he wrote uh, the book of Romans, uh, where he explains what water baptism is all about and why it's important that every follower of Jesus is baptized in water. In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 2, he likens um, it to the Israelites going through the Red Sea. Uh, it's after the Passover where Pharaoh has, has said to Moses, yep, take the people away. And they were delivered from slavery in Egypt and they were heading for the promised land. For Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate, ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Uh, people say, are we saved through baptism? Uh, no, uh, you do not receive forgiveness of sin through baptism. Uh, they received forgiveness through the Passover lamb and their faith in the blood that was put on the doorpost. And God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. My judgment will not come to your household because of the blood. No, it's through the death of Jesus that you're forgiven for your sin. So were they free when they got to the water's edge of the Red Sea, and their former slave masters were chasing after them to, to re-enslave them? Well, they were sort of free, but they were certainly a whole lot more free on the other side of the Red Sea when their slave masters had chased after them through the way that God had opened up um, the, through the Red Sea. And, and yet in Exodus 40 verse 30, it tells us that the enemy were drowned. And they went back and they saw the corpses of their former slave masters dead and washed up on the shore. Uh, Wayne Gruden puts it like this. Uh, when he talks about baptism, he says, it is the amazing truths, the reality of passing through the waters of judgment safely, of dying and rising with Christ, and of having our sins washed away. You see, this is what the Apostle Paul says we're to do with the waters of our baptism. When he says in Romans 6 verse 11, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So what he's saying is this, whenever you want to be set free from your sins, these things which you don't want to just keep being forgiven for, but you want to change from, he says, go back to the waters of your baptism in your mind and say to the devil, I don't work for you anymore. I've got a new slave master. It's righteousness. It's not you. And you can say, God, I believe that I died with Jesus I believe that my old life of sin was buried with Jesus and, and now I can say the new life I, I now live in you, I live by the power of the Holy Spirit. Please would you set me free and help me to change. And so this morning I want to help us to see how we can do this. But, but first let me ask perhaps two very practical questions. And the first one is this, if you haven't already been baptised, if not now, then when? We are arranging a baptism service soon. There are those who have asked to be baptised. Uh, that's in the planning and maybe now is your time. Why don't you get in touch and we'll get it organised? 
And you can say, as you look back on your baptism, that's where I go back. And I know that God has set me free. But the second question is this. If you have already been baptized, are you living in the good of it? And this is the good news that, that Jesus has not just brought us into forgiveness for sin, uh, but he's brought us into freedom from sin. Because we don't just want to talk about freedom, we want to experience that freedom. Uh, we don't want to be like that docker, just reducing Christianity down to a message of, of hope somewhere over there, but we can know it in the here and now. And so it has to come from an understanding of what the Apostle Paul is saying uh, when he says we've got a new master. Now, towards the end of our service, we're going to share communion together, bread and, and wine. And so baptism is firstly a sign of God's grace, where, where he declares that I have saved you by re uniting you with my son, Jesus Christ, and with his people. But it's also a sign of commitment where I say I'm committed to God and his people. But it's also a sign of belonging where we say together we are united to Christ and committed to one another. It's a one-time confession that you have died and been raised to new life in Jesus Christ. And then communion is that ongoing act of commitment together. Again, as we remember, not only that Jesus has died for us, but that we have died with him. And so we take the gospel into ourselves as a sign of that commitment. So how does God change us? Well, that's what Paul goes on to explain in Romans 6, verses 15 to 23. Um, he says, sin will no longer be your master because thanks be to God, you have been freed from sin. So verse 18, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and ever increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefits did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you've been set free from sin, and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. And one of my favourite verses in the Bible, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So as we share communion, it's, it's a freedom banquet where God invites us to look back on the waters of our baptism as he invites us to not only receive forgiveness, but to receive his freedom. Now, if I said to you, how do you receive forgiveness for your sins? We looked at this last week. It's the, the A, B, C. It's, it's A, I admit my sin. It's B, I, I believe Jesus died for me, was buried for me, rose again for me. And so C, I commit my life to him. And yet, do you know that receiving freedom from sin is exactly the same? It's the same A, B, C. You know, one of the things for me before lockdown is, is I would say things like, um, if only I had a bit more time, I would do that. And yet, you know what I've discovered during lockdown is that I've had more time and I haven't done it. You see, the problem wasn't out there. The problem was in here. So I need to respond as well. And it's the same ABC. It's A, it's to admit. Uh, you know, you say to God, I, I know that you love me. You've proved that you love me in and through Jesus Christ. But, but I have to admit, it's as though I'm separated from the power that is given to enable me to change. And we'll see this as we go on to chapter 7. The Apostle Paul says, the things I know I should do, I, I don't do. And the things that I wish I didn't do, I do. And I can't do it on my own. Uh, but it's coming to God and it's admitting that there is this barrier be between us that has to be broken down through the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but then B, to believe in Jesus. Not just that he died and was buried and rose again for you, but, but that you died and you were buried with him and raised a new life in him. You know, the New Testament tells us when Jesus was crucified, 
Uh, two robbers were crucified with him on either side. And when Paul talks about being crucified with Jesus in Romans 6, he uses exactly the same Greek word. So why would you believe the Bible when it tells you that two robbers were crucified with Jesus and, and not believe the Bible when it tells you that you and I were crucified with Jesus? It makes no sense. Uh, no, we say, God, I really do believe that Jesus has not just bought me forgiveness, but he's also bought me freedom. And so see, I commit my life again to you today. I make that active decision. And can I say, if you've not been baptised, then it's for you to make that active decision to be baptised in believers' baptism in water as an active first obedient step to Jesus, my new master. And if you have been baptised in water, you can say, I'm coming back to uh, the shore of my baptism, to the waters of my baptism, to, to come and commit afresh. I want to live out this new life that I began on that day. Um, and that's what I need to do. I need to remember back uh, to my baptism, to what I said and believed in my heart. And so I can actively say to the devil, I don't work for you anymore. And to say again to God, you're my new master. Now fill me anew with that same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Because I know that the wages of sin is death. And I've already died with Jesus. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In, in other words, it's the very life and power of heaven. It's the Holy Spirit, as Jesus says in John 6, verse 63, uh, the Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I've spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. So he is the one who gives life, coming into our hearts, raising us from the dead to not only know forgiveness, but also freedom to change. So as we come to a time of communion, it's, it's an invitation to look back to the cross where Jesus died for you and for me and, and you and I died with him. And because of that salvation, you can back, look back to your baptism and you can say, uh, I died and was buried with Jesus in baptism and I've been raised to new life and righteousness in Christ. And so we look to God's present day grace as we look forward in anticipation to all that God has in store. And as we prepare to take bread and wine, we're going to listen to a new arrangement of a song. Um, it's with Steph McLeod and, and the praise gathering online as we come to a time of, of sharing together. And as you watch this video, uh, you may well recognize uh, some familiar faces.
constantly learn What Father so tender is calling us home He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor Our sins, they are many, His mercy as we come to take uh, bread and wine, let's pray together. We thank you, our Father in heaven, that although our sins, they are many, we praise you that your mercy is more. Not only for the forgiveness of our many sins, but also from the freedom from sin. We are free from the power and slavery of sin as we have died to sin and our real lives are now raised and hidden with Christ in God raised to new eternal life. And so we share in this freedom feast together, looking back to the cross where Christ has, has brought us into the place of undeserved privilege, where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing in God's glory. And today we can know your freedom as we know your present day grace. So as we take bread together, we ask that it would be significant in its meaning. It would mean to us Christ's body that was broken for us. And as we take that gospel into ourselves, we know that the wages of sin is death. And yet we thank you that we have already died with Christ, receiving the gift of God, eternal life. That we have been raised to new life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we thank you in Jesus name. Amen. So just where you are, take uh, some bread and break it just as the body of Jesus was broken. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And let's eat together, giving thanks to God uh, for Jesus.
What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. As we take the cup, it's a reminder of your blood, Jesus, poured out for us for the forgiveness of sin. May we know the freedom that that brings. We ask it in your precious name. Amen. So again, where you are, take uh, your cup and let's drink together with grateful hearts. Thank you for joining with us today. Just a little reminder to book on the church website for um, next week's service. Um, we pray you have a blessed week. Take care.